Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. We're live here at Owens Intermediate School, home of the Bobcats. And hey, it's raining outside, but the minds are bright in here today because today we're all here to. Yeah! Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Jesus. And if you're here in Bakersfield, you can reach us at 636-4357. In San Luis Obispo, you can call us toll-free 1-800 or 1-866-636-6284. Um, you can also email us at do the math at kern.org. You can watch online at do the math online.net. And look for us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. Well, you know what? Jesus, nice to have you in studio with well, us again. it's great to be back. Yeah. And uh, remind everybody, like, your regular duties. Yeah, so my regular nine to five is I'm in a, at Cal State University Bakersfield. I'm in the teacher education, so prep, prepping teachers for the future classroom, and uh, I work particularly with the residency with a rural school rural school district placement. Okay, so. and you know what? You're also a member, and I have been also of the Kern Mathematics Council. Yeah, and you've got that attire on today. So yeah. a little bit about that briefly. For so you. the Kern County Math um, the Kern County Math Council is a membership comprised mostly of teachers, educators in Kern County, and really our focus is just networking with other teachers, um, just sharing the idea of what it is that we're doing and helping to spread the message and the, you know, great strategies in mathematics. Well, you know what? We will be going out to Bessie Owens to visit with Devin and the students out there. Surprising that he said it was raining outside, so it might be maybe over there and moving around. Right. Uh, bring that up because CSUB has a baseball game tonight, so hopefully they get that in there tonight. <laughs> We have a very special guest in the studio. They'll be joining us shortly. We have a uh, phone call to get to in just a few moments. But before we get to any of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, so I saw this article and it had to do with the saying. So we'll mm -hmm. go ahead and put the saying up on it's up on the board right now. What's the origin of the sometimes always never rule? Now, have you ever heard of that rule before? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And not in math, but I've heard of it. I right. <laughs> and uh, I found a little way that we could tie that to math in a, in a little bit. Uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll put this up here right now. So if you're wearing a three button blazer, those are the only words you need to know. Sometimes always never. The middle button should always be fastened. The top button is up to you. The bottom button, don't button it. Okay, okay so that's if you have a three button blazer. Now, where did this all start? Well, over a century ago, King Edward VII started growing a belly. Okay, mm -hmm. so here's King Edward, and here he is in other attire, well kingly fed. attire, sure. right? And uh, so anyway, what happened was he started getting a belly. Now, Edward liked to eat on, get this for a typical day. Oh, did you know that today is National Pancake Day? Yes, it is. It is. Did you go have some no, uh, flapjacks, pancakes or too anything? too busy today, but I did yeah, see uh, it. Busy I myself, yeah. but always like a, a <laughs> plate of, uh, plate of uh, Hot cakes pancakes. They're yeah. always good. So anyway, he would plow down a plate full of bacon and eggs for breakfast, a tower of roast beef and shortcakes for lunch, and a 12-course dinner. 48-inch waist was his size. Yeah, nice. All right. <laughs> now, yeah, all right, indeed. The man liked to eat and ate well. So Edward grew so quickly that he couldn't fasten the waistcoat's bottom button. Deciding that he liked the look, he kept it unbuttoned. Okay. So here's a vest, and here's a vest that is completely buttoned all the way. And here's a vest and they did not button the bottom button. And there are a lot of uh, gentlemen that will not button 
on a vest, the bottom button. Now, I'm not sure if this has to do with the vest or the blazer only, sure. but the blazer I have always, growing up, have always been told, you know, you'll, you don't bot, you know, button that bottom button. Oh, yeah. Uh, but some guys do it with a, a vest as well. Hmm. All right. And here you can see the three button suit, middle button, must button. Mm -hmm. Top one, optional, bottom button, yeah. don't button. Got it. All right. And now here's another photo mm -hmm. of Edward. Mm -hmm. There's his vest, or his, I guess you would be in his coat. His, his coat anyway, mm -hmm. with an overcoat over it, but does not button that button on the bottom. Now, Edward influenced a lot of fashion crazes. So people noticed that his bottom button was undone. The trend caught on, men of all sizes decided to leave that bo the bottom button open. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, so that's not the only fashion trend that he started. So we can see right here, this okay. is a tuxedo, all right? You can thank him for the tuxedo as well. When Edward was still a prince, he wanted a slightly more casual alternative to the extremely formal dinner attire of the day. He opted for a blue jacket, black trousers, and a bow tie. In 1886, an American friend of his mm -hmm. brought that style back to Tuxedo Park, New York, hence the name Tuxedo. Huh? So that is where that comes from. Very now, cool. we need to tie this all into math. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look underneath the camera right here. And this is a homework assignment that a student had. And it says, for each statement, determine if always, never, or sometimes. Okay, circle the correct answer if sometimes stayed on the line when it is true. Mm -hmm. So, in the first example, x plus 4 is equal to 5, well that's sometimes true, mm -hmm. right? It's true when x is equal to 1, because if you made it 2, sure. that wouldn't be true. All right, we can take another look at an example here. Using the distributive property, we would go 2 times x is 2x, 2 times positive 6 is positive 12, so we would have 2x plus 12 equals 2x plus 12, so that would be yeah. always, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. Agree. So we can see how that works. And that's just a little way that you can apply some math to the always, never, sometimes rule. And that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. And I, you know, was so busy talking about that bottom button and things yeah. like that. I forgot to bring up our special guest. In studio with us right now, we have Emily. And Emily, how are you today? Good, how are you? I'm wonderful. Why don't you remind everybody or let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I go to Independence and I'm in 10th grade. And what math are you doing right now? I'm in Algebra 2. You are loving it? Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> really? Sometimes. All right, all right. Well, good. So here we go with the always, sometimes, never there rule, it right? Is. <laughs> so sometimes you're loving Algebra 2. Um, so what is the next math class? Because this year is kind of drawing to a close here pretty soon. You know what your next math class will be? Um, I'll be in math analysis next year. Okay. And that is kind of what, and you're in what year now? I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore. Grade. And a lot of students take that when they're seniors. Yeah. So you're going to be able to do another math after that. Yeah, calc. Right. So that would be very good for you right yeah. there because, uh, you know, like I say, the more math you're able to do in junior high and high school, the more options you have when you go out of high school. Right. So are you ready to do one problem for us? Sure. All right. Head on over to the board. This is one that uh, you have done in the past. You have not done this this year. So we have 9B plus 5 is equal to 23. And this is a problem that a lot of students are working on when they're doing pre-algebra, algebra one. So if you would be so kind as to explain to us how to solve this problem. So what you would do first is you would subtract the five, and then you would put it under the 23. So 23 minus five, okay. minus five is 18. So then you would keep the equal sign and you would bring down the 9B. So. And, and what we can do real quick is just drop the screen down a little okay, bit perfect. so that way you can, yeah. Perfect. Get some more space. And then you would divide 9 on each side, or 9B on each side. So 9 divided by 18 would be 2. So. Okay. So let's look at something really quickly. I'm going to back you up for just a second if that's okay. Um, let me just start off by asking you, in fact, I'm going to erase this first part of it, which you have here, because I want to ask you some questions of, just to help other kids that are not start, that are barely starting this. Um, there might be some kids out there that have never done this type of math before. So you had 9B plus 5 is equal mm -hmm. to 23. 
And you said you wanted to subtract five, mm -hmm. right? Now, it's correct that if you subtract five over here, you must, what you do to one side, you remember this rule, what you do to one side, go ahead and finish that statement. You had to have said it before, right? Um, what you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So there's this rule of equality. That equal sign means that these two sides are currently the same. So if I take away five from one side to main, maintain equality, I have to subtract five on that right. side as well. That's how you got 9b is equal to 18. Right. Now, what I like to explain to my students, because if they've never seen this before, they need to see this 9b. What does 9b mean to you when you see a 9 and a b side by side like that? Well, I know that 9 um, is multiplied by b. Good. So we know that that's a multiplication right. problem. So for someone that may have never done this type of thing, 9 and a letter b next side by side like that is multiplication. Right. So let's start off by saying, in order to do this, like you said, plus 5 is the opposite, is minus 5. So what is the opposite of multiplying by 9? Divide. Dividing by 9. So if I wanted to isolate b, I want to get b all by itself, I'm going to have to do the opposite of multiplying by 9. So you've made your fractions here. Go ahead and put your divide by 9 underneath it on both sides because the equality still rule, uh, rule still applies here, right? Right. So we're going to say dividing by 9, and you can, we're not going to put the b there yet. We'll just leave, oops, so go ahead and with the bottom of, yeah. We're not going to divide it by b. We're just going to say these both sides will right. be divided by 9, and then that allows us to cancel off that 9, right? right? And now we have this 18 divided by 9, which is what? 2. OK, so, so we have our answer. B is equal to 2, which is our final result. Now, I'm going to ask, hold on to your pencil one more, or pen one more time. Let me ask you, and this is always a good idea to do. When we solve our problem, we said that 9 times B plus 5 is equal to 23. That's the right. statement. You found out that B is equal to 2. Right. How can we check to make sure our answer is correct? Well, if you replaced, well, you know that B equals 2. so. Mm -hmm you would replace b with 2. OK, so can you come over to the side and maybe just rewrite this? But instead of writing 9b, let's write it 9 and then times exactly. And then go ahead and finish that math off for us, please. So let's solve that. 18, mm -hmm. which is 9 times 2. Perfect. It would be, so 18 plus 5 would equal 23. All right, and put your little V that shows that 18 plus 5 is 23, just the same way you did up there. Perfect, so do we still have this equality here? Do we have one side equaling to the other, yeah. and that's true? Yes. Perfect, so we have our answer here. Thank there you, you go, nicely done. Verify that answer as well. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We'll put Emily back to work in a little while, but right now we're going to go out live to Bessie Owens and hook up with Devin. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Back here at Owens Intermediate School, we got a room full of 4th and 5th graders and we've kind of taken a little bit of a wrinkle for what they generally expect out of math. First of all, say hi, everybody. Let everybody know how you're doing. They are so thrilled to work with you today, and it seems very quiet and well reserved. But no more than two minutes ago, this entire room was enraptured with conversation about subtraction. You should have heard it. We're going to give you a little bit of a sample of that with an activity that we're going to call today Same or Different. So, Here's what we are presenting to our students here at Owens Intermediate today, to our young Bobcats. We put up two figures uh, related to math. We asked students to discuss in their groups what they noticed, and then asked them a very simple problem about what they saw. Are these two things the same or different? And I think their answers might be very surprising. So let's go ahead and take a look at the work that they've discussed here at our front board. What you notice on the right is a very straightforward and familiar representation of subtraction. 4,236 minus 527 equals 3,709. But then we also have something very on to the right. Well, is it similar though? Because it's not the way that most people are used to. And so I wanted to throw out here to our groups what you notice. So reflect back to when you first saw this. What were some of the things, before we get into same or different, what were some of the things that you noticed? Yeah. I noticed that the first problem was in expanded form and the other problem was in standard. So the values here were expanded. So instead of 4,236, you saw that this was expanded out to 4,000 plus 200 plus 30 plus 6. Yes. And was that true with the second value as well? Yes. Okay. So the place values were broken up. Okay. What else did we notice? I noticed that the expanded form, they were indiv 
individually subtracted, not just 4,000 plus 200 plus 30 plus 6 minus 500 plus 20 plus 7. So you it notice that, so, and so, on. so the subtraction was broken up by place value uh, in, in this first version that you saw here, okay? What else did we notice? Yes, sir? Uh, not all the values are aligned and, and the ones place is, doing, is being subtracted from the tens and tens is being subtracted by the hundreds and then the, the hundreds is being subtracted by the thousands. So you notice that in this first version, the place values were not lined up by similar place values. And I definitely heard that conversation, and a lot of people were looking at that, and I actually heard this. I heard somebody say, well, that's incorrect. But I want us to see if we can reflect on this idea now, okay? After additional observations, are these the same or are they different? So what are your thoughts on this? Are these the same or are they different? I think they're the same because they were represent the same numbers and they get the same difference. So because both of these have a version of 4,236, and both of these involve taking away 527, they both end up with the same difference. Now, how were you able to process the difference here as the same as 3,709? Well, I added it by, um, because 3,000, 3, 500 plus 180 would be three, would be 3,680. Now, was it too was it difficult to add those two together? It's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, okay. What did you do from there? Then I added 23. Okay. Which would be 300, 36. I'm just gonna say the numbers. 36 and no, 37. Oh, okay. 37. Because we crossed the 100 over there, right? 37 and then that's 6 to bring us to 3,709. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? I thought that they were both because they, ha they both used different forms to get the same answer. So would that make them different or same in your mind? Um, well, same because they both get the same answer. But I also think that it's different because of the way they set it up to get the right answer. So you're able to identify that both of these end up with the same solution, but the method of using friendly place values instead of substitution mm -hmm. allows you to get to this. So it's a friendly strategy that is a little different than how we normally subtract, but it does have its powers. When we come back, we're going to take a look at another same different prompt at a little bit more of a higher level, and we're going to go very visual with how we see this. But that's for later. For now, we're going to send it back to the studio. Mike, take it away. All right. Thanks for that, Devin. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. And if you're calling from San Luis Obispo County, that phone number is toll-free. The number's at the bottom of your screen. If we do one of your math problems, you'll automatically receive ice cream, courtesy of Doc Bernstein's Ice Cream Lab. So something to look forward to right there. We have Emily Yu in studio from Independence High School. And are you ready to get back to work? Yes. All right. Head on over to the board. And we're going to expand on the last problem you did a little bit. So okay. here we go. 5x minus 2, open parentheses, 4x plus 3, close parentheses, is equal to 9. And if you could wonderfully explain that one like you did the last one. Okay, so the first thing you would have to do is you would have to distribute the negative 2. So, it would be 5x, and then you would do negative 2 times 4, which is negative 8. Okay, there's an x there with it. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And then um, the negative 2 uh, multiplied by the 3, which would be negative 3, and then equals to 9. So the next thing you would do is you would have to combine these two, 5x and negative 8x. So it would be negative 3x minus 3 equals 9. Okay, and let's drop this screen down a little bit so they can... Thank okay, you. There it is. And then this is similar to the last problem. So the first thing you would do is you would add the 3. Ooh. <laughs> So then 9 plus 3 would be 12, 
and then equals to negative 3x. All right, now I'm going to stop you here for a second. Okay, what I'd like you to do is take those last three lines you've written where you have negative 3x from there down, erase that. How about we use the bottom row? Okay. Yeah, so that way we can get, yeah, yeah. go ahead and do the rest of that for us. All right, so now what I need you to do, uh, Jesus, bring that screen down a little bit so that we can see the beginning of it again. Sure. So I understand you got the 5x, and you went negative 2 times 4x is negative 8x, but where did the negative 3 come from? Uh -huh. Well, it would be negative 6. There we go. <laughs> That's what I need you to look at. All right. Go okay. ahead. Now continue. So now combine like terms, it would be negative 3x, and then you would subtract 6 equals 9, which you would bring that down from here. So then you would do similar to the last problem. So you would add 6, and it would be 15 equals negative 3x. Mm -hmm. There you go. Go ahead. There you are. OK. And then you would divide by negative 3, and it would equal negative 5. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> There it is. Okay. Sounds good. And we now, could, yeah, yeah, go yeah, because I was going to say, I could have waited for you to get through the whole thing yeah. and then yeah. check it. <laughs> yeah. So let's just check it to make sure, okay? So you, you've defined your answer to be x. Whenever you see an x, we know that we're going to substitute that with negative 5. Okay. So our original problem here, can we maybe just try that on top? Or if you want to rewrite it off to the side, we can do that as well. Okay. Where would you prefer? So, so can I draw? Yep. Okay, so five, you would... Um, and then we can put in parentheses if you want, so that way it kind of keeps it clean. Negative five, right? So that was yep. five times the negative five, right? That's okay. Good. And then subtract by two, and then four x plus three. Okay, so there's the x again, right? So we so want to substitute So this would that. be a negative five. Right. Equals nine. So I'm going to re... I'm going to... And we can, okay. Can I erase this? You can, it's your board. <laughs> it's erased now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can always undo anything with a undo, but okay. that's fine, yeah. So let's rewrite this out. So five, Wait. negative five. Yeah. Oh. You're hitting it with your sleeve, that's all. Yeah. Two, four, and then you have negative that. five plus three equals nine. Okay. So from here, you would multiply negative 5 times 4, which is negative 20, plus 3, which would be negative 17 equals 9. You can keep those in part, yeah. 2. Okay, go ahead. Let's erase the bottom part that's there still. So we have 5 times negative 5, and then you still have your negative 2 times 17, negative 17. So let's start with the 5 times negative 5. So 5 times negative 5 would be negative 2, 5 minus 2 times negative 17 equals 9. So okay. 17 times 2. So 34. Okay, so now let's, let's carefully look at this. We have a negative 2 times a negative 17. Those are both negative values, right? Right. So what would be the result of that 34? Is it a positive or a negative? Negative. Well, so we have a negative oh. 2 and a negative 17, so that gives us a positive 34, right? And now what you have is a negative 25 plus 34. Right, so it would be 34 minus 2, 25. Mm -hmm. So it would be 9. Yep. And if we just gave you a little bit more space here, so you could show us that in our... So what we just This did, would equal 9. Right, then, which is 9. Perfect. So what we've just found out was you solved the problem and you have your negative 5 as your x was negative 5 and you plugged negative 5 back into the original problem by doing substitution. Right. And yes, 9 is equal to 9, so our equality is there. So we did get our answer right. So there you go. Congratulations. Nicely you right. done, Emily, since you verified that and it did work out and I saved you a little bit of problem <laughs> by not going back and doing it again. Right. Anyway, uh, we'd like to award you a meal free of uh, <laughs> our friends at Chick-fil-A. You like that little graphic, huh? It's you know, pretty cool. They come up with that in the here. back there. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We'll be back with more right after this.
Today we're in San Luis Obispo County. We're at Shandon Elementary School, and today we're here to... school and I've got fifth grade student Imelda. You ready to go? Yes. All right, let's go ahead and you can grab a marker. And here's the problem. So you're going to eat one and a half pizzas every day during the school week, except for Thursday. So let's go ahead and figure out what we've got here. You're going to eat one and a half pizzas every day. Mm -hmm during the school week. How many days are there in the school week? Five. Okay. Except Thursday. So how many days are you going to be eating one and a half pizzas? Four. Okay. So I guess we'll put it four and we'll just put it right there. All right. So this is pizzas and this is days. Now the problem is we want to know how many pizzas you'll eat during the school week. So how do you want to solve this problem? Um, by subtracting? Well, we could subtract, right? But if you eat one and a half pizzas today, and you eat one and a half pizzas tomorrow, how are we going to know how many you add, you ate all together? By adding. By adding them, right? Okay. And if you ate one and a half pizzas the next day, what do we need to do to that? Add. Keep adding it, right? If I say you're going to eat one and a half pizzas for the next 180 days, are we going to add one and a half 180 times? Yes. Is there an easier way to do it? By multiplying. By multiplying, right? So we could do this and add it four times, or we could multiply the two numbers. So which way would you like to do it? By multiplying. Okay. So how would you like to do this? Mm. And then we multiply 1 times 4. Okay, so you can go 1 times 4. That equals 4. Okay. And then 2 times 4. That equals 8. So what are you going to do with that then? We're going to put it up over here for the, because we're going to multiply this one and this one. We could. But there might be an easier way to do this. So let's try this. If we go one and a half, can we turn that into a mixed number? Uh, yes. How do you do that? Do you know how to do that? So we're going to multiply this. Two times one is what? Two. And then we're going to add at the numerator. So two times one is two plus one is? It's three. So three over two is the same as one and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're going to multiply that by four. Now if I put four over one, is that the same as four? What's 4 divided by 1? 4. 4. So it's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So this way we can just multiply straight across with the fractions like that. All right? So let's go ahead and multiply straight across. 2 times 4 is 12. Okay. And 2 times 4 equals 2. Good. So we still have our fraction line there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what is 12 divided by 2? 6. Okay, so we can simplify that, and that's going to equal 6, six. right? Because 12 divided by 2 is 6. So now think about it for a second. If you eat one pizza for four days, how many pizzas did you eat? Four. Six, four. Well, you eat one pizza a day, uh, right? And you do it for four days, you're going to eat four. Okay, now think about this. Okay, so the one is going to give us four pizzas. Now, you're only going to eat a half a pizza today, and tomorrow you eat a half a pizza. How much is that all together? One. One, right? But that only took care of two days, right? So we have two more days to do. So you eat a half a pizza. The other day. And then another half, and what do you eat? Another day. And all together, what do those two halves make? Two. One. What? Well, right. Okay, so you've got one more, but those made two, right? So the four plus the two give you? Five. Six. There you go. Four plus the one is five, plus the other one is six. So if you eat one and a half pizzas every day for four days, how many pizzas will you eat? Four. 
Well, yeah. Four days. Six. So six pizzas. Kind of makes sense a little bit? Yeah. Because if you eat a whole pizza, you're going to have four. And the half pizzas together for four days are going to be two more. So that's why you've got six pizzas. There you go, Imelda. Nicely done. push to allow students to graduate from high school with options. And I think this is just another example of the options that kids have today. Some will go right to the world of work, some will learn about further certifications they can possibly get, and some will just really figure out what career they may want to have tonight. Nice. We're particularly excited about the fact that we have middle school students here as well as high school students because it sets them on a career path early. That was actually pretty easy. I like it. And it gives them an opportunity to explore all the different career options. I wanted to see engineering stuff and it was really cool to see how you can build stuff and then program things. Do you like math? Do you enjoy science? Do you like working with people? Do you want to be outside? Do you want to work with your hands? All of those different things can be found in many different careers. Well-paying jobs, great benefits. In the past, a lot of the vocational trades didn't get a lot of exposure. We expose them, they come in, they see and they go, hey, wait a minute, I didn't even know that I could go to school at night and work during the day and make a wage, a decent wage. And it gives them an idea, you know, we have all the vocational trades here, so, you know, this is not what you want. We have the electricians, we have the operators, we have the carpenters, the sheet metal workers. It helps a lot based on what I know about engineering. It helps a lot to know what they know and that could help me become what I want. There are over a hundred vendors here from all different sectors within our county. And so students are able to explore those different career opportunities, understand what's required in terms of education, skills, knowledge, background, and then pursue that. They may not need to make a decision today, but their eyes are opened up to all the possibilities in front of them. And once again, a big thanks to all of the staff and students at Shandon Elementary School. Great time going out there to San Luis Obispo County to work with the students. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We'll get Emily back to work, but right now we're going to head out one more time to Bessie Owens and visit with Devin. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Back here at Owens Intermediate, back with a room full of Bobcats with another same different prompt. Now, while you guys were in the studio, we took the opportunity to talk and organize our thinking a little bit and I really want to share what we had to discuss here. So I want to go ahead and give you the prompt that we have had under consideration here. So on the left side we have four-fifths divided by two-thirds. And on the right side we have twelve-fifteenths divided by ten-fifteenths. So something interesting that came up as far as identifying what they noticed is that some of the things they noticed were common and some of the things that they noticed were unique about each of them. And so we organized our thinking with something a little different. Normally, you know, when you think of comparing and contrasting, there's a Venn diagram. Uh, this is a model which you may have seen in some schools called a double bubble map. What I like of this, about this is that you have more space in the middle for all those things that are common. Because if you've ever done the two circles that overlap, you ever notice that you run out of space really quickly and then you have to write really, really tiny in those little corners? It's a pain. And if you're like me, your handwriting is terrible. And once you get into those corners, no man or woman will be able to decipher your words. So what we did is we took advantage of the space. And the students in the room were able to put together some of the things that they noticed were the same about both of these division sentences. They noticed that they were both sets of equivalent fractions. So four-fifths was equivalent to twelve-fifteenths. And two-thirds was equivalent to ten-fifteenths. They also noticed that both of them involved dividing fractions. One young man in the back, oh, go ahead, let's, let's give him credit right back there. What's your name, sir? Julian. Julian right here saying hello to Julian world. Julian identified that in both of these sets, all of the numerators were even, 
and all of the denominators were odd. And I thought that was, that was something I hadn't even noticed about that. We then looked at how they were different from each other. Some of the things they noticed were different. They noticed that on the left here, the denominators were different, but on the right, the denominators were the same. And that's really important to notice, and I'm glad that we got that called out. And then they also noticed that the sets of numbers involved in each were different. So the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5 are the only ones that appear here. They don't show up in this second one, but likewise, 10, 12, and 15 are exclusive to this. They don't show up over here. So now we get to the big question. Are these two the same, or are they different? Your thoughts. Let's go back to the start of the day. Julian right here in the back. What are your thoughts? Same or different? They're the same because um, they're both the division and they're both the same fraction. So, so you're saying they're the same because the same values. Well, no, what you're saying is they both involve division and they both involve fractions. So they're the same. Okay? A any other ideas that you'd like to share here? Yes, generally. Um, I think they're the same because they're equivalent fractions. Yeah, and also that they're, uh, you're dividing in both of them. So what you're saying is they're both the same because you're dividing the same values. So even though there are different numbers involved, the fractions have the same values, so the divisions should end up with something identical. Okay? Any other comments? Are these the same or are they different? I think that they are the same, and because they are also equivalent and not only that they are division problems or the reason that they are equivalent would be because five times two equals ten which is our first numerator on the other so side. So from what I'm hearing is you have a system for dividing fractions. Does this involve flipping fractions at all or? Yes. Okay so you're seeing this as four-fifths times three halves, right? Because we're all familiar with, familiar with this idea of keep, change, flip, right? Okay, so when you do that, you multiply across and you get what? 10 and, or for the first, for the top you get 12, okay. and for the bottom you get 10. All right, so 12 tenths, and that reduces, we end up with something along the lines of six fifths, right? Okay, did you do that over here as well? Or do you notice something you could do that is a little different than what you might notice? What are your thoughts here? Um, that other than flipping it just like that, you could you can realize that the first that the first column it'd be um, the denominators are both five five and three, and you notice that they're unlike, so you wouldn't be able to divide it just there. So you would you can find a multiple that's common between both of the numbers, which would be 15. And so you'd multiply five, um, five, four fifths with three over three, over three, which would equal with 12 fifteenths. And then you'd multiply two thirds, you'd, you'd multiply it by five over five, which would get 10 fifteenths. Now, something really interesting that I think you're starting to notice once we left it off at this frame. You've probably been told, when it comes to dividing fractions, that you can't divide across. And that's so disappointing, because you can multiply fractions across, and that makes all the sense in the world. But try to divide, and people give you dirty looks, don't they? That's my dirtiest look I just made on camera. What happens if we divide across? What's 15 divided by 15? 12 divided by 10 is a little tough, but how else can we write 12 divided by 10? Yes? Well, I was thinking, how many times does 10 go into 12? So how else could we write that? We could write it as a division problem, oh. right? 12 divided by 10, but we could also write division. Uh, she's saying, she's doing it with her fingers. How? <laughs> and now? The, with the line and then it What do we call that? Long division. A fraction. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey. Isn't that the same thing? Instead of flipping anything and changing the symbol, why don't we just get the common denominator and just divide across? Because when we do that, we're always going to end up 1, so our answer is always going to be what's at the top? 12 tenths. <laughs> when we come back, we have one more same different prompt, but for now, we'll send it back to the studio. Mike, take it All right, away. thanks for that, Devin. We will visit Bessie Owens in just a little bit. We'll put Emily back to work in a bit, but first, we have a problem that a student called in with from Stern Middle School, and it was Allie, and 
we're going to go ahead and work on the problem right now. So Jesus has got it written up on the board, and Jesus, take it away. All right. So um, from this problem, it looks like there's two quantities that are going to be added. So we have a negative y plus 5, 3 plus the quantity 7.2y minus 9. And then it says all of this side is equal to 6.2y plus n, some variable n. Um, so what we're looking at is we're going to combine these two quantities. These two sums right here are going to be added together. Um, but we can't just go about adding them. What we have to do is identify the like terms, if you will. I notice there's a negative y. And in my opinion, that is the same as writing this as negative 1y, because 1 times anything is itself. There's that identity there. So I'm going to put the 1 in front. It helps me understand what exactly I'm trying to combine. And I have 7.2y minus 9. 6.2y plus n. So now that I have this 1, or negative 1 in front, I know that I can go ahead and combine my negative 1y and my positive 7.2y. Well, 7.2 minus 1 is just going to give me uh, 6.2y. Now, I want to take a look at this problem right here. There's a 5.3 and a negative 9. And I want to kind of have a conversation with my uh, call-in student, Allie. She was saying that uh, it was, let me find out what that number was again one more time, 5.3 and 9. There's this 5.3 minus 9. And this is kind of a difficult problem to find out. Is it a positive answer? Is it a negative answer? If you look at this on a number line, here's where we're at. And it kind of makes a little bit more sense when you say, OK, here's negative 9. And I have to go 5.3 in this direction, in the positive direction. So I'm going to end up with an answer that's still going to be negative. That's the important piece here. Well, the way that I can find the difference is just subtracting them. Negative 9, or 9.0, um, and then 5.3. If I subtract these two numbers together, and just regrouping some of these things here, I'm going to end up with this 3.7. So I have the answer 3.7, but it's negative 3.7. So let me go ahead and just take this number back, and let's put it over here. And this is negative 3.7 still equal to 6.2y plus n. All right, so I have my y over here on this side, on the left side of the equation, and I have a y on the other side. Like we were working over here a few minutes ago with, uh, with Emily, we were talking about this idea of equality. This side is equal to that side, and if I undo, or do the opposite of this plus 6.2, I'm going to subtract 6.2y from both sides. When I subtract 6.2 from positive 6.2, I just get 0. And I'm left with negative 3.7. And then these two sides, well, look, 6.2 minus 6.2y also cancel out, leaving me with just 0. So the only thing left on this side is just n. And I've now solved for my variable n here. There you go. And hopefully that helps out Allie and anybody else that was working on that problem right there. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. And Emily, now that you're well rested, Back to the board, young lady. Time to get you back to work. <laughs> so here's another problem. So x minus 3, and that's over 40, is equal to 4 over 5. And if you would be so kind as to solve for x. OK, so the first thing you would have to do is you would have to use what's called like the bow tie method. <clears throat> so. It would be x minus 3 times 5. OK. And then over 40 times 4, which is 160. So let's deal with this first. So mm -hmm. um, let's do at 5x minus 3. You would use distributive property. So 5x minus 15, oops, mm -hmm. 5x minus 15, right? So then you would subtract 5, which would equal negative 3. So then it would be, hold on, one second, one second, one second. equal negative 3. So then you would do 
And that's okay. all. So let's I go it. ahead. So let's let's actually back up a little bit and let's talk about this. Um, I, I'm concerned with the piece that you did here, this bow tie method. I just want to know when we look at this. I know that this side x minus three over forty is equal to four fifths, right? And I would agree that if we multiplied four times forty, I would get one sixty. But that's on one side of the equal sign. That's and then right. we have okay. So let's go ahead from there. Okay. So you can go ahead and just erase this bottom piece right here okay. and leave that up. The, the work you did at the top makes sense. Oops, here we go. Okay, so then it would be. And I'm going to drop it down a little bit for you so you can. Okay, go ahead. 160 equal equals 5x minus 3. Mm -hmm. So then you would use distributive property, which would be. And we've done, we got 5x minus 15. 5x minus 15 which equals equal 160. Mm -hmm. So then the next step would be you would add the 15. which would be 175 equals 5x. Then you would subtract 5 so from each five side. That is divided by 5, right? Because we're going to, this says 5 times x, so the right. opposite of multiplying is dividing. Right. Okay. And then 175 divided by 5 equals 35. Oops. So then the way you could check that So we know that x is 35, that's right. what you're telling us. x is 35. And what we've done in the last three or four problems we've worked on each other is we've always said, okay, if we know what our answer is for x, let's go ahead and substitute it back into our original problem and see if that, if that works, if we right. still end up with equality here. Right. So the original problem was x minus 3 over 40 equals 4 fifths. So to replace x, it would be 35 minus 3 over 40 equals 4 over 5. And we'll just clear off the bottom real quick. I'm going to bring this up and just erase this so we can make sense of what you're doing. All right. Now, we know that 35 minus 3 is. This is a simple math problem, so we'll just go and do that math in our head. What is 35 so minus 3? 32. Over 40, which is equal to 4 fifths. Now, we currently have two different numbers, 32 over 40 and 4 fifths. Are they equal is the question we're wanting to really answer. If we simplify this, it might make more sense to us. So do you see a common factor 32 and, that 32 and 40 have in common? Um, 8. Okay, so if we divided both of those by 8, we have eight divi or 32 divided by 8, which is? Is 4. And 40 divided by 8? Is 5. Okay, so we do. When you plugged in your 35, we got the same answer. So we know that x must be equal to 35, going back to the original problem. This okay. x has to be 35. Good job, Emily. Thank you. Nicely done. All right, we've got a couple of moments. Why don't you go ahead and erase that board? I've got one more problem for you guys to work on All today. All right. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the camera and number 17. So what is the sum of the terms right. in the infinite series? So Jesus, okay. let's go ahead and start writing these. One right. plus one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. And we'll just leave it like I mean, because we keep okay. on going. We can just put And I know as soon as I mentioned this problem, Emily had a big smile come across her face because she's very excited about doing this problem right <laughs> hey. now. So, okay. Emily, kind of, how would you guys go about this? And I'll give you guys about four minutes to work on okay. this problem. How about you stand just off to the side real quick and we'll kind of talk a little bit through okay. this piece. All right, here's one of the things that I would start by saying is let's just kind of use some, um, some sense making on this problem. What, what is the smallest value that this could be? I mean, I'm when you think six. about it, look at all of the numbers that are present here. What is the smallest? Like, if we had to say it's somewhere, it can't be smaller than this, but it's probably bigger than this. So we're just going to kind of guess. I see the number one. I see a half. I see a fourth. The smallest value that this could be, even if I erased all of these numbers, these fractions that are confusing us right now, if we erased all of those, the smallest this answer should be is at least one. So we know that our answer has to be greater. I'm just going to write this. It must be greater than one. Can we agree on that? Yes. Even if these didn't exist, if I erased all this, we still have at least right. one. So I know my number's bigger than one. So now what we have to do is figure out, well, if I took a half, a fraction that's a half, and I added a fourth, and I added an eighth, and I added a sixteenth, and these three dots just mean keep adding. You saw what's happening here, right? They're just, right. we're saying take this half it, right. or double it, and then it'll keep going. What I want to ask you is, here is a fraction box. I'm going to take you back to sixth grade, okay? So come okay. with me here on this journey. Here is a half. Agree? Okay. Well, what if I took that same fraction box and I wanted to make a fourth? How many boxes would I make? Four. So I would break these in half, right? Okay. Now this is a fourth. 
I'm going to drop this down a little bit more. I'm going to make another fraction box. And I want to make an eighth, which is really taking the fourth and breaking that in half. So you might see the pattern happening here is every time that I go and make a new fraction box, do you see I'm just breaking this into a smaller half? Right. Here's another one. What would be the next one if I did? Sixteenth. All right. So if I did these, you would see there's going to be 16 fraction boxes, right? Right. All right. So I made a mistake on there. But this is now 1 16th. Now, try not to think mathematically. Just look at this pattern here. What do you notice about the size of this fraction going to this fraction, going to this fraction, going to this fraction? What they do you notice? Smaller. They're getting smaller. In fact, they're halving in size, aren't they? This is half, half, half. So what we're really saying is, we want to go back to the original math problem. Now that we have a better understanding, I know that my answer has to be at least one, and I'm going to add all these fractions, but the fractions are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So if I kept going, let's just say 100 times, it's going to be a really, really tiny fractional amount. I mean, it's right. going to be super small. So it's not even going to matter at some point. But I can tell you that a half plus a fourth, if I was to come over here, if I was to take a half, this is a half, and I was to add this fourth to it, it would be right here which is going to give me 3 fourths. Three fourths. And then if I added an eighth to that, whatever that answer is, it's getting there. And now I'm going to go smaller, and then I'm going to get smaller, and I'm going to keep going and going and going. What do you notice is happening to this fraction bar as I keep adding and adding smaller and smaller pieces to it? What is it getting close to? The yeah, is which is the whole entire, right. this is one whole, this is one whole. Right. So what we're doing, and this is kind of a tricky problem, but what they're saying is add a half, add a half of that half, add a half of that half, add a half of that half, and I'm just going to say keep going forever. And visually what you notice happening is I'm just going to keep adding a little bit more, but at some point it's so small it doesn't even make a difference. So this is equal to, all of these fractions are equal to 1. So here's what we're looking at. All of this is really the same as 1, 1 whole plus one whole, right? So what is one whole plus one whole? Two. Yeah. So the result to our problem that we're looking at, even though this looks really crazy, when you kind of think of it visually, it makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? So our final answer to this problem would be? Two. Two. So this series does end in a, a value. And we can say it's about, we know it's actually two. But when we keep adding half and half and half and half, we just have to say in theory, right? <laughs> There you go, nicely done. And Emily, I know that when you first saw that, your eyes got big and you're like, well, how am I, you know, what's going to go on here? And a lot of students see problems like that and they're like, all right, well, I've got a half and I've got a fourth and I've got an eighth and I've got a... Yeah. And some students would approach this as like, all right, well, let's get a common denominator and start doing things. Yeah. And you could do that, okay? <laughs> but once again, remember that this is an infinite series and it's going to keep on going on and on and on. So just kind of talking a little bit about it right there and then visually representing it kind of makes a little more sense, right? Right. And you can see that the whole thing, as you and Jesus saw, just keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the problem simply is, mm -hmm. what is the sum? Well, it's just one plus one, the answer is two, right? So a lot of different ways you could write one with all of those different friends. Yeah. So there's a little something you could bring to your teacher tomorrow. Say, you know what, how many different ways can you write one? You know, what are you talking about? I could write it as <laughs> one, right? Well, you go, well, how about a half plus a fourth plus an eighth and do something like that and see what happens. Great job. You'll be the charm of it, all right? All right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 636-4357 mm -hmm. is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, and we've got a little bit of time left. We're going to go out one more time to Bessie Owens and visit with Devin. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Back here at Owens Intermediate School. It's a very chatty room, a lot of hard work. So we have our third same or different prompt of the day, our final one. And you can tell it was a little bit of a relief when we revealed it to these students because they had seen some structures work. But what they're really driving with right now is creating a double bubble map for these two figures. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what they're comparing here. So we've got a very traditional representation of multiplication, 26 times 33. To the right we see a more visual structure to help support the idea of the pieces that go into that called the area model. So it actually breaks up 26 times 33 as 20 plus 6 times 30 plus 3. So features of the distributive property to bring all those pieces together. So I'm really curious to see how the students identify how these differ based off of what they notice. So let's take a look at some of our double bubble maps here. 
So how did you guys set up your double bubble map on noticing the differences between these two? We just looked at the problem from the board and we tried to figure out what was different about them and what was the same about them. So what's interesting is that you represented the problems very differently. You actually expanded out how that second problem was written based off of the boundaries of the area model. Whereas for the first one, you wrote it out in a very straightforward horizontal method. This is standard form, and then you recognize this as an area model. And then you identified as well that both of them did utilize the same values and the same products. So thank you for that representation. That was very straightforward. Back over here, we have a lot of differences that we're identifying here. So you represented both of these by their structure. So instead of writing the actual problem, you guys identified one as the area model and the other as what's called partial product. So kind of describe what you noticed with uh, the two. Um, I didn't write this one down, but up there, you can see that... Um, so there's on the big one there's 600 and then on the lower one below there's 60 which is basically there's no zero there All right. and then on the other one there's 1800 or, eight, or eight, 180, 180 don't okay. know how to, how to say that um, then there's 18 which is basically no zero right there they both have 18 or 6 it's very interesting how both of those end up being identical except with a zero added when they're multiplying by 30 instead of just 3. Really interesting observation there. Excellent. Thank you very much. So let's check in back here with our other group. Hey guys, how's it going? Everybody? So tell us a little bit about what you put together here. So we, for something that was different, for the area model, we thought that the size of the boxes were different from when you usually do area model because it will be equal boxes. But uh, on the picture, the most, the base number, which is 600, mm -hmm. has the biggest box. Oh, okay. And 18, which is the smallest number, has the little, <laughs> the little box. Do you think that's important to make sense of the size of some of the numbers that you're working with? Yes. That's a really interesting piece, and and you guys noticed that perfectly. That's exactly how I laid it out, so that we made sure that the largest place values created the largest squares when we multiplied. So yeah, 20 times 30 involved the largest place values of any of those numbers. So excellent observation there. Wonderful. All right, let's see what they think of this, whether they're the same or different. Let's come back together, please. And big question to wrap it up. Are these two the same or are they different? What are your thoughts? Go for it. The, the problems are both the same, just represented in different ways. So they're both represented in different ways, but they do ultimately both multiply 26 times 33. And I think what is interesting too is that if you look at the numbers, they both appear here. That 60 plus 18 equals 78, 78 which is what happens when we multiply 26 times 3. Just like 600 plus 180 equals 780 for when we do 26 times 30. So we both end up adding the same values together ultimately to end up with the same product that you guys identified at 858. Wonderful job, and the sun is out finally here at Owens Intermediate School. Wonderful day. Let's get out there and enjoy it. For now, back to the studio. Mike, take it away. Yeah! All right, nicely done out there at Bessie Owens, and uh, nice to see that the sun has returned yeah. over there. And uh, simply a good thing for the CSUB baseball game tonight. Yeah. That starts at 6 o'clock. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. The phone numbers are at the screen periodically throughout the program. We would like to thank Emily for coming in this afternoon, yeah. a sophomore at Independence High School and doing some great work. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union,
Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.